prepare to experience the strongest radio allowable by law. Secrets will be revealed. Myths dispelled. From the studio gym where excuses never apply. It's Superhuman Radio with your host, Carl Lenore. Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of Super Human Radio. Today is August 13th, 2020. We're going to be talking about a subject we talked about before on this show, and that is uh, psychedelics, how they affect the brain. Uh, later in the show, we're going to be talking about uh, those who like to forage, people who are looking to forage. Uh, we're going to talk to a, a father and, and daughter who have uh, made a lot of uh, foraging more popular around the country. And uh, it's timely, too, given the fact that so many people are worried about how they're going to get their food these days. Of course, we have to thank our title sponsor, Legendary Foods. The website is eatlegendary.com. The code is SHR10 to save 10% off everything there. Check out their nut butters. Their nut butters taste like they're loaded with sugar, but they're not. Uh, you'll feel like you're cheating, but you're not. Uh, they have the most amazing decadent flavored nut butters, and they will stay in your uh, pre pre prescribed uh, eating style. If you're a, a low carb, high protein type person, you'll love them. So check them out, show them some love. Of course, feel free to post any questions during the show today. Uh, we're happy to work as many questions in as possible, uh, as long as they fit the discussion. And now I will be joined by my guest, and that is Dr. Frederick Barrett, and he is uh, over at uh, John Hopkins Medicine. How you doing? Uh, Dr. Barrett. I'm, do I'm doing well, Carl. How are you doing? Good, good, good. So uh, why this area of interest, first of all, psychedelics? Uh, what research preceded this that uh, that made you want to know more about how they affect our brain? Right. Well, uh, I'll give you the executive summary. I I've always been uh, really interested in trying to understand my own mind and the minds of others. And, and uh, I, I, my first uh, my first degree program in undergrad was music education because I played I played music for most of my life and and uh, I I thought I, I've always recognized music as, as a really good way to kind of communicate emotionally and to explore yourself but emotionally and help others to do the same but but uh, along the way I, I really got enamored with, with psychology and then the brain and uh, I went to grad school to get my PhD in psychology uh, and I and I went. Uh, studied in a program at University of California, Davis, where I was able to use music as a tool to evoke memories and emotions in the brain. And, and then I, I learned methods of using uh, MRI and, and other techniques to study the activity and the changes in the brain that occur when we do all kinds of things as the human out in the world. And um, So I used music as a tool to study emotion and memory in the brain, but but music is complicated because people are complicated. And, and uh, you know, we have these tr tricky things called preferences that make it difficult to to really determine what music is going to evoke a specific response in a given individual. And along the way, I, uh, there was another graduate, uh, graduate student at the time, Catherine McLean, who was a couple of years ahead of me. And she came to Hopkins to work with my mentor, Roland Griffiths, to study the effects of psychedelic drugs on people with a meditation practice. And they were able to do some brain imaging with this. And she knew that I did studies with music. And she said, how oh, can you, you know, can you tell me how you design your studies so that we can look at the effects of psychedelics on emotions, and we can use music to, 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 to evoke the emotions, and this all makes sense, and I basically got her to hire me so I could do it for her, and um, she subsequently left science, but, but you know, I saw this amazing opportunity in, in psychedelic drugs um, that are such powerful modulators of consciousness and cognition and emotion, and I thought, well, if we can really use these as tools to understand more about consciousness and the brain and emotion, then, then we may really have something. So that's that's kind of how I got into it. So that that's one aspect of the psychedelic drugs. The other aspect is that there's this, uh, let's say for lack of better terms, this inertia mm -hmm. that occurs with a brain uh, BDNF upregulation and even uh, neuronal sprouting. Um, I, I, I had the great fortune of, of uh, having an opportunity to sit and talk with Dr. Timothy Leary when I was living in Las Vegas and he came to UNLV to do a lecture mm -hmm. and no one showed up because no one knew who he was. Wow. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I know. And, and, and back then, the group that he was involved with, a lot of these pioneers in psychedelics believed that, uh, you know, tripping, for mm -hmm. 
for lack of better terms, cause the right and left hemisphere of the brain to start to bypass the corpus callosum, this data clearinghouse, and communicate directly. And this is why things like uh, synesthesia and original thought were possible uh, once you started to experiment uh, with these drugs. And so we know now that, I mean, I, I think I read a couple of years ago that the College of London was doing a, a large scale study with uh, low dose LSD on people who suffered from uh, major depressive disorders. I, I've never followed it. I don't know what the outcome was. Maybe you do. Um, but it, th these chemicals are really amazing because they not only uh, alter our perception of our life in the now, but they seem to have a uh, an effect later on as well. I mean, remember, I, I don't know, I, I'm 62. I remember being told by my, my, my parents, don't do LSD because you'll be walking down the street 10 years from now and you'll have a flashback. They called them a flashback. I'm still waiting for the flashbacks. Like, I'm still waiting for it to happen, you know? But it's these 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 compounds are amazing, and there's evidence that um, uh, early uh, uh, Native Americans used them. In fact, they followed the buffalo. It is said that those who followed the buffalo would pick the mushrooms out of their excrement and eat them, and it would it would change their lives. These are really amazing chemicals that go far beyond even just this one category of discussion today. Would you agree with that? Well, so so they they certainly do have a rich and varied history, and and there certainly was a lot of misinformation that was shared about psychedelic drugs, especially in the 60s and 70s, uh, at the point at which psychedelic drugs became kind of a vector for culture wars. Uh, and and uh, I, I, you know, I want to I want to preface this by saying they are controlled substances, and you can get in a lot of trouble for for for, for seeking them out and, and using them. Um, and, and they're not without their risks. These are very powerful drugs, and lots of people have used them, you know, over the past God knows how many decades, uh, and been fine. But there have been plenty of people who legitimately have run into real issues using them. So they are powerful drugs. But 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 the reason that they're getting so much attention in science and in, in popular culture now is because of these really profound effects that they can have. And and a lot of the research that's going on is is focused on the acute effects of drugs. So of these drugs. So so when you're you know when you're under the effects of the psychedelic drugs, all kinds of really uh, uh, profound and abnormal things are happening. And and of course people really want to understand that uh, as best they can. And I I think that's really really valuable to do. But I'm actually more interested in the long term effects. Um, you know what's happening in in your brain or in your mind a week or a month or three months or a year after you've taken these drugs and 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 that's where the real therapeutic value of these drugs is occurring so so you mentioned the the, the studies by imperial college london um, they they published a study in 2016 uh, where they demonstrated that two separate doses of, of psilocybin actually which is the active component in magic mushrooms um uh, that Two administrations of that compound under very controlled settings in a clinic uh, led to uh, most of the people in that study uh, who had treatment-resistant depression, which means that they uh, had had depression that was long-lasting, that, that uh, they, they sought multiple forms of treatment and nothing really gave them relief from their symptoms. Um, these people, after two doses of psilocybin, uh, many were at least reduced to mild to moderate depression or somewhere went into remission, if you will. And, and, and after about three months after just two doses, a lot of people started to kind of float back up towards being depressed, but, but many of them were still in remission. And, and, and that remarkable effect um, uh, was, is, is, was, was also uh, met with a couple of other studies that were published in that same year. One that was published by our group here at Hopkins, demonstrating that, that folks who had uh, a late stage cancer diagnosis um, also saw similar reductions in depression and anxiety. And, and, and if you, if you get a, a terminal or a late stage cancer diagnosis, one of the most difficult things to treat aside from the cancer is the kind of, uh, overwhelming existential crisis that you, that, that most people face. Like, oh, I'm not ready. Or what am I, I'm leaving my family behind. Or, you know, I, I'm not done with life. I have more that I want to do. Or, you know, and, and, and it's a terrible position that people end up in. And, and, uh, People who, who were treated with psilocybin under controlled conditions in our lab, uh, most of them saw saw incredible reduction in that depression and anxiety. So this is what everybody's excited about. Um, yeah. and, and this is what, yeah, for good this reason. Is, that's right? really useful. Um, so talk about the area of the brain 
that you saw most of the activity and seems to be the focal of your your research now, right? It's called the claustrum. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. The claus the the claus claustrum. So not to be confused with colostrum, which is completely different. <laughs> right? Right? Uh, 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 so the claustrum. Yeah, it's this really thin kind of a sheet of gray matter that's tucked in in the almost the center of each of your hemispheres of your brain. So if your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere, and it's like right in the middle of each one. And it's, it's, it's the, the word claustrum actually, uh, I think it's derived from a, a Latin word meaning hidden. Um, so, so like cloistered, and, and Cla like cloistered, like, like cloistered. cloistered. Yeah, 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 like exactly. Cloistered. And, cloistered. and uh, I think they had, yeah, they have the same root and, and, um, and, and, and it was called that because it is buried deep within each hemisphere of the brain and was very, very difficult to find and to, and to, and to study, uh, especially in, in, in what we call preclinical research or animal research. Um, over the past, you know, you know, many decades, and um, it wasn't until recently that I, that, our, that my colleague uh, Brian Mather uh, at at the University of Maryland uh, developed techniques to really um, isolate and identify the claustrum in in animal models, um, and and within human uh, models, it wasn't until very recently uh, we 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 uh, together uh, I together uh, in collaboration with with folks at University of Maryland, including Dave Semenovich. And, uh, and and Sam Krimmel uh, came up with a way of actually identifying and trying to measure claustrum activity in humans. The thing that makes the claustrum interesting is that um, the, the one thing we do know about it is that it seems to be heavily interconnected with just about every other por par uh, part of the cortex. The cortex is kind of like the outer layer of the brain where a lot of the a lot of the computational processing happens. And of course, the claustrum is not the only brain region that's highly interconnected with other things. The thalamus is another one of them, and, and, and there are lots of what we call hubs in the brain. But but essentially, this claustrum region was bi-directionally connected with everything uh, in, in such a unique and pervasive way that um, in 2005, Francis Crick of DNA fame and Christoph, Christoph Koch, who, who is a famous neuroscientist, uh, they kind of teamed up to, to, to publish this uh, this theoretical, this hypothetical uh, article, and and they, they highlighted the claustrum and said, well, you know, if you were to have one brain region that was going to stitch together all of this various sensory information from the environment into a unified percept that we experienced consciousness, well, geez, the claustrum that would be your, that would be perfectly set up to do it because of the way it's connected to everything, and 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 they they threw this hypothesis out there. I think there's data that have been shown more recently that the kind of kind of undermine that idea that the claustrum is like the seat of consciousness or the conductor of consciousness um, because if, if such a brain region existed and was orchestrating the integration of all this information to, to create a seamless percept of consciousness that we all experience it would have to be active all the time and it turns out it's really not it's only transiently active at different points but but in the meantime my colleagues at the university of maryland figured out that um that it's actually uh active uh, and, and most active at, at, at high effort uh, decision making points in places where we have to like really rearrange our brain uh, network organization, uh, you know, functional organization to, to attend to a different thing. Like I'm, I'm closing my eyes and I'm thinking of a memory, but then the phone rings and I have to pick it up and I have to orient my attention outside or I have to, you know, make a, a difficult decision. So that, that seems where the claustrum is, is functioning uh, most. So it sounds like the claustrum is like the clutch of the brain, right? You're shifting gears. So it's, the, it, it makes the transition smooth from what you're doing here to what you're about to do. And it puts yes. you into that. It, 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 it probably uh, activates faculties of the brain that put you into a, sp a place where you're not starting from scratch. You, you already, you're already in motion to handle that already. Like it's firing up all the faculties to go along with that. That's really fascinating. Can, now, can we, can we see that? In functional MRIs, uh, when people are asked to do certain things or certain life experience, can we see that activity go up and down in this region of the brain? That's precisely what we found in, in, a, in a paper where Sam Krimmel was the first author. We published in NeuroImage, the journal NeuroImage last year, where we both uh, rolled out um, our method of trying to uh, isolate claustrum function in humans with MRIs, and we showed that's precisely what happens. Yeah, when, when doing certain types of decision-making tasks, then you see the claustrum come online. But why it's most interesting to us uh, in terms of psychedelics 
is because the colostrum is also one of the brain regions that very densely expresses a receptor that psychedelics latch onto. So it's the serotonin 2A receptor. And d decades of research before this have really identified the serotonin 2A receptor as being responsible for everything we understand about psychedelic effects. And, and so psychedelic drugs bind to the serotonin 2A receptor, then kick off all this ca signaling cascade that, that, that leads to whatever states of mind we find ourselves in. So the, the, the idea then became, well, if, if psychedelics are binding to 2A receptors in the colostrum and then disrupting colostrum function, could that lead to, could that be like the, 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 the kind of tipping point that leads to all of the other effects that we see? And, and the, pub the study that we just recently published with psilocybin administration changing colostrum function seems to point in that direction. It's a preliminary study. It's a small sample size. Um, we, we, we could have had more stringent control conditions, but, but that's, that's basically what, what we found is that, that, that it may be that, that disrupting colostrum function is what then allows psychedelics to disrupt all kinds of other brain network processes. So when we talk about things like uh, uh, synesthesia, mm -hmm. is it because the colostrum is connected to all these other brain regions and somehow because it's the clutch, so to speak, it, it can actually take them offline and make them do certain things, let's say, is the reason that we experience synesthesia. And I, I, I remember so many instances of synesthesia as a, as a young man in high school. I remember one day coming home after dropping some acid and coming home, it was raining out. And back then we all had the fancy hairdos and I had to blow dry my hair. And I remember seeing the heat coming out of the blow dryer. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking, wow, that is amazing, you know? And people mm -hmm. talk about uh, listening to music and, and feeling sensations of taste. And this is where these different regions of the brain, they start to get confused, for lack of better terms, and start sharing data, if, if, if you will. Is that all happening in the claustrum? Is that why we experience synesthesia? Because it does communicate with all these other areas of the brain? So I can't answer definitively. We haven't done that study to determine it, you know, with with uh, proper controls and all these things. But but let me let me uh, let me uh, speculate for a moment, right? So um, you have you have these networks of brain regions in the prefrontal cortex and the medial prefrontal and the lateral prefrontal cortex that are involved in decision making. And you have these other networks like the frontal parietal attention network, like here and here, that are involved in the deployment of attention and resources to help su support that decision making. And these brain regions, uh, they, everything interacts in the brain, and there's no isolated thing in the brain. Everything, everything is interacting, but, but a lot of these brain regions will exert top-down control on sensory information uh, to help aid in all of the things that we do when we go out in the world as human. And, and, and uh, the brain is a big kind of prediction engine. Um, we, we, we take in sensory information, we try to process it and, and come up with a model of what's happening, and then we try to predict what happens next. And, and, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the, the action of these prefrontal and, and, and frontal parietal regions and, and regions deep within our brain and the basal ganglia. These are all interacting to try to predict what will happen next. And in trying to predict what will happen next, sometimes we have to kind of filter out extraneous information, right? So, so if the colostrum is sitting there uh, acting as a, a gear shift when we're, when we're shifting between all of these different operations, right? Some of those operations involve these, these executive regions exerting top-down control on sensory information. They say, okay, that, that stuff's not interesting. The olfactory stuff's not interesting. Forget that. We need to look at visual stuff in order to make this decision and behave, right? Mm -hmm. But if you, if you then kind of like, you're, you're, you're flying down the highway at 60 miles an hour, and then you just kind of remove the stick shift from your car, you're, you're not going to be able to, to, to do those things accurately. You're not going to be able to exert top-down control over sensory information and and then but but those other other regions of the brain that are just looking at everything and trying to make predictions and models about the world they're still online and they're thinking what the heck is going on because i have this flood of information and and the speculation would be that taking out the stick shift then uh, undermines the ability of the executive to filter everything mm -hmm. and that may that may be one way that we get synesthesia there, there are other models out there of brain function uh, and there are other ways that might explain these things and frankly we're just get the tip of the iceberg now but yeah so taking out the claustrum might theoretically do that so so ironically um the act the actions of psilocybin on the claustrum i i, I thought it was going to be that it was heightened activity 
but in yep. fact, it reduced activity, didn't it? Yes. <clears throat> and and that's and, and and why that's the case still un, un, not not entirely clear. Uh, our our measurements of activity in the claustrum were were not perfect. Um, we uh, one of the things we did was just look at variation in signal in the claustrum, and that became smaller. Uh, it's actually possible that. That you know, if if you were kind of maxing out the activity of the claustrum, it may be at ceiling, so there's less room for variation, or it could be reducing it overall. But but, but we can say for certain that it's being disrupted, and and we can also uh, well we we seem we seem to be able to say that it's been disrupted, and then we can also look at the relationship of claustrum function to other brain regions and networks, and the, you know we think of uh, something called functional connectivity, which may be related to how brain areas or networks communicate and that communication was reduced as well and the, the reduction in claustrum communication with higher brain regions was also correlated with a reduction in the integrity of those brain networks and, and, and the degree to which nodes in those other brain networks are communicating amongst each other so it seems that turning down claustrum function or altering claustrum function alters all of these downstream things Interesting. So do you need to, and so what kind of dosing are we talking about here? Micro dosing of, uh, of LSD precursors, like one P LSD is very, very popular today. You know, psilocybin is a little sketchy because there's little standardization unless you're in a lab and you're buying something from Sigmin Aldrich or something like that. Um, there's little standardization. So people are turning to the more chemical type uh, uh, compounds like like one PLSD. Do you have to, for these things to occur, do we have to be on a full all out trip or do does microdosing do this in some uh, noticeable way? So there, there are a couple things to unpack there. One is that um, microdosing seems to have gotten a lot of buy-in from a lot of people who are doing it and claiming that it's helping them. Uh, on one hand, uh, if it's helping you, great. On the other hand, uh, it, it really has all of the hallmarks of a really beautiful placebo effect. The problems <laughs> include, but are not limited to the fact that very little science has actually been published on this yet. There are maybe three, maybe four studies that have been published so far on microdosing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and by and large, the the effects are a big fat zero. Mm -hmm. um, the, nothing detectable except a, a, a slight shift in the function of a brain region called the amygdala was was detected, but but nothing behavioral, nothing cognitive, nothing in creativity, nothing in perception or attention, and and I, I have colleagues who have who have unleashed an enormous battery of somewhat sensitive tests. Uh, on microdosing and, and they came up empty handed. Um, uh, so so it, it could be that the tests that people have used so far aren't sensitive enough to detect these changes. It could be that we're asking the wrong questions, but but so far, I, I don't think there's any convincing actual empirical controlled science to suggest that microdosing does everything. But assuming it does, the effects that we showed in this Claustrum paper were with uh, essentially a, a a super threshold dose. They were with a larger dose than microdosing for sure. It okay. was 10 milligram per 70 kilogram dose of, of, of psilocybin, which it's, it's difficult to say, uh, but the, the average dose of actual mushrooms that it would, would, would account for that are, are, you know, on the order of like one to two grams of, 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 of mushrooms, which is a substantial dose, but it's yeah. not a dose that will, will uh, give you this kind of peak or mystical or kind of ego dissolutive uh, experience. And, and this is only one study that we've published that has ever been published with psilocybin and claustrum in humans. So, so uh, you know, we're, one small study with 12 people in it uh, is, is uh, well, you know, it's more than 15 people, but, but it, it, you have to be, you have to kind of put the brakes on the, the great generalizations you can make about it. But yeah, it, it, we don't know anything about claustrum functioning, uh, changing with, with microdosing. Okay. So, so yeah. 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 No, that, that's good. So, um, a lot of people who do threshold doses where they actually, their, their perception of, of, of reality is, is altered. They, they talk about feeling a connectedness with everything. Mm -hmm. And that connectedness uh, seems to be abandoning the ego, if you will, for lack of better terms. Right. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. th that's what your research was kind of looking at, right? Your research was titled that, that the psilocybin actually tamps down the ego center 
of the brain, which I am assuming that the uh, claustrum is considered the ego center of the brain? Well, yeah, to, to be completely fair, that, that, that tamping down the ego center was, was the press release that was released about the paper. We don't actually use the word ego in the paper. And, and, and I think that if you're going to try to pin the word ego on a, on a brain region or network, um, that, that others have, have claimed that the default mode network is really the kind of the seat of the ego. I, I have, I, I have problems with the word ego and, and, and the whole psycho, psychodynamic framing, but I'm, I'm not going to go down that road right now. But if, if we, if we can assume that the, that the, the default mode network has some, uh, functioning related to what we call ego, uh, it's, it's actually that connection that I mentioned a little while ago that claustrum activity and connectivity with the default mode network was correlated with reduction in integrity of the default mode network. Mm -hmm. so, so as claustrum function reduced, so also did the connectivity of the claustrum with the default mode network. And as the connectivity of the claustrum with the default mode network reduced, so did communication among all of the regions of the default mode network. And and that's I guess that's what, what we're really what we're uh, saying is that is this this claustrum connectivity may 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 be involved in in reducing default mode network which has been shown in a number of other labs and a number of other publications that LSD psilocybin ayahuasca and, and possibly other drugs reduce default mode network connectivity and that may that may relate in some part to to these this ego dissolution kind of effects I want to take a quick commercial break and when we come back I'd like to talk about what from your perspective this means in a clinical sense, you know, what, 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 what does this have the potential to do for sure. people? If, if, if we can, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back with more superhuman radio. Stay tuned. Okay. <clears throat> Over 11 million people in the U S have some form of retinal damage, also known as macular degeneration. This is expected to double to nearly 22 million by 2050. Artificial blue light, age, type 2 diabetes are all contributors. Doctors say there's no cure. Armed is changing that opinion. In one clinical trial, 93% of patients had arrested or improved their condition. 54% reported lessening of glare, reduced dryness, and improved clarity and comfort. And 0% felt worse during treatment and no side effects. Take control of your macular degeneration or keep it from ever occurring. Go to wisechoicemedicine.com and get armed today. Do you remember those delicious toaster pastries you had when you were a kid? You know, the rectangular sugar-filled snacks? Well, guess what? Legendary Foods has just made low-carb toaster pastry. This is the first of its kind, and honestly, these things are amazing. They have three to four net carb, less than one gram of sugar, and nine grams of protein. You can eat them right out of the wrapper or lightly toast them. The only question is, which flavor? Strawberry or brown sugar cinnamon? They're available at eatlegendary.com and Amazon. Unlock your potential with the best cognitive enhancement and anti-aging supplements on the market. PureNootropics.net goes the extra mile for the highest quality ingredients. Third-party tested to make sure you only receive the best your money can buy. There's no better choice with their money-back guarantee and free shipping. Try their best-selling DHM, dihydromyositin, <laughs> hangovers, and helps deliver detox after a night of drinking. Get your DHM and other nootropics and longevity supplements from purenootropics.net, the purest supplements around. Select Savory Snacks Original Biltong is the healthier alternative to sugar-laden beef jerky. Their sugar-free biltong is seasoned and then air-dried for up to two weeks, providing you with one of the most tender and flavorful meat snacks that you've ever had. They also use use a fattier cut of beef, which adds to the tenderness and gives their biltong even better flavor. Select Savory Snacks Original Biltong is the perfect snack or travel companion for your busy life. Get a free meat snack sample pack with every order of $75 or more. Get yours today at selectsavorysnacks.com slash SHR. Use code SHR free. Are you still on the fence about body protection complex BPC oral from drseeds.com? Listen to Maggie Kuhn, one of the owners of the Sea Bus Lifting Company, Jim, in Columbus, Ohio. I had been having some baggy tendon issues that weren't injuries, just, just things that were 
were annoying. You know, I'm 58 years old, so just older tendon kind of issues. For us powerlifters, you know, we really don't got training when we have just nagging issues. We just kind of keep pushing through. And I started the BPV. What I noticed was I was doing some heavy tricep stuff that um, that would have killed me um, before when I had an elbow problem, and I was able to do that with literally no pain at all. Go to drseeds.com, D-R-S-E-E-D-S.com. Use coupon code SHR and save 20% off your bottle of BPC Body Protection Complex today. Whether your goal is to build muscle or burn fat, you'll find everything you need at Redcon 1. Need help getting a good night's sleep? Try Fade Out or the most popular pre-workout supplement on the market today, Total War. Sign up for their new transformation challenge and win $10,000 or shop for apparel that people at the gym will know that you are serious about your training. Need a testosterone booster that works? Check out Boomstick. Whatever you need, you'll find the best quality supplements on the market at Redcon 1. Go to redcon1.com. That's R-E-D-C-O-N, the number one, dot com, or go to superhumanradio.net and click the Redcon 1 banner ads today. This is the Superhuman Channel, doing reps with the weight of the world. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Fred Barrett from uh, John Hopkins Medicine. We're talking about how uh, some psychedelic drugs may be interacting with the brain and how this may give us uh, a better insight into maybe uh, some disorders, right? I mean, so now you the, now you, you want to look at like major depressive disorder. What does this region, the claustrum of the brain look like with these people? And then it, it, can you change that status? with maybe uh, these drugs that seem to act specifically on that region of the brain, right? Yep. Yep. The, uh, honestly, those are the multi-million dollar questions that we're asking, <laughs> that we're hoping to ask soon. Um, the, the, uh, the thing, the, one, of the, one of the things that, to think about when, when thinking about psychedelic drugs for therapeutics is the remarkable way in which, at least so far, preliminary evidence has been shown that that uh, careful application of psychedelic drugs in in a therapeutic context uh, may be helpful in in treating not only mood disorders like depression but also substance use disorders like tobacco use disorder or alcohol use disorder or maybe even cocaine use disorder. Um, just a little side note on that: uh, that's that's unheard of almost uh, completely in, in 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 therapeutics for substance use disorders. You know there there are uh, some uh, compounds out on the market. Uh, and available for prescription to, to help treat opioid use disorder. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Opioid <laughs> use disorder or or alcohol use disorder or tobacco use disorder. But you know, there's separate drugs, specific drugs for specific problems, right? Right. You take the patch, you take the patch or you chew gum for, for smoking, you you take anti abuse or something uh, like that for, for alcohol use. You you may you may find medication assisted treatment with buprenorphine or uh, uh, you know or something similar for for, for opioid use disorder. Um, but you don't, you know, you don't, you don't see these single interventions being broadly applicable for for a number of things. But almost the same intervention with psilocybin seems to possibly be effective for a lar a wide range of substance use disorders. So, so that's remarkable. But then broadening out, you have to ask yourself, well, why would a drug like psilocybin be so effective in treating such a wide range of disorders like mood disorders and substance use? Disorders and possibly other disorders. Uh, you know, people are now studying anorexia and OCD and and headache, cluster headaches. And then you, you really have to start to scratch your head and and and, and it'd be reasonable to say uh, this is starting to look like a panacea, and that should really worry us. Um, but wait, 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 but wait, but what, <clears throat> should it worry us? Or well, is it possible that the claustrum is the <clears throat> underpinning of lots of, uh, for lack of better terms, you know. Uh, uh, uh pro problems that the brain has that 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 it seems to be the lowest common denominator of functionality of the brain so when you alter that you alter everything upstream from it well that's the great 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 question I, I couldn't have paid you for that uh <laughs> that that's that's exactly the question you so so there there could be transdiagnostic processes at work um something common to to uh, a number of these disorders is some form of an exec this dysfunction of executive control. Um, in, in patients with depression, there may be too much top-down control of, of, of emotion and behavior. In, in patients with substance use disorder, there may not be enough top-down control over rewarding behaviors and seeking rewarding, uh, rewarding actions. And, and uh, as, as, as a colleague and, and, and someone, a mentor of mine in the past said, you know, uh, 
sh demonstrating that you can develop a substance use disorder is a, is a sign of a really healthy functioning reward system, but it may be also a sign of, of possibly a, a change in, in the effectiveness of your executive. And so uh, the colostrum being positioned kind of as a switch stick shift for the executive, yeah, it could be that not, I, we really have no idea whether the colostrum itself is, is, is showing dysfunction within these these disorders, but that doesn't mean that targeting the colostrum couldn't help, right? So, so there have been a lot of analogies of psychedelic drugs, uh, such that you know you're shaking up the snow globe, or, or you're, you're you're fixing the antenna on the TV, or you're smacking the side of the TV to get it to work, and 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 all of these kind of uh, give you kind of a sense or a vision of, of of like a reset process, right? And and it could be that disrupting the colostrum. Uh, leads to a cascading set of other network disruptions that kind of lead to a reset, you know, and, and, and there's this principle in neuroscience, a uh, basic principle, fire together, wire together, you know, neurons and circuits that, that, that are, are reinforced become stronger and they can take over your functioning. And, and, and it, it, uh, the question then becomes, could, could kind of resetting through kind of disrupting the colostrum lead to that kind of resetting of network function that allows someone to then have the room to recover uh, from from some of these types of disorders. So so one of the uh, uh, most used, I think, brutal resets approaches <clears throat> that we have in in psychiatry and 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 brain science is the electroshock therapy. Mm -hmm. So do we know anything about how electroshock therapy affects the claustrum? Has that been looked at? No, no, and and I'll I'll come back to the the history of the claustrum. It's been so difficult to get at for so long that the very little work, especially in humans, has been done with it. There has been work with the claustrum, uh, more work been done in, in animal models. But but yeah, again, this is the tip of the iceberg and, and we don't know what the claustrum looks like with ECT. Uh, but uh, an interesting side note, some people have referred to psychedelics as a chemical ECT. And, um, and, and the benefits of psychedelics over ECT could possibly be that you know you don't get the the potential uh, accumulating uh, brain damage that you may occur from uh, ECT or or the memory loss that you, that occurs with ECT. Well, well, so so I, both my mother and my sister underwent electroshock therapy at different points mm -hmm. in their lives. My sister yeah. went the one underwent it because she was misdiagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and they they tried mm -hmm. everything, and they said, "Well, we're going to try electroshock therapy." And I can tell you mm -hmm. that uh, both my mother and my sister, after coming out. They were zombies for the rest of the day. They were zombies. I mean, there was yeah. nothing there. They were hollow people. And then they would slowly kind of snap out of it. I was never a zombie after tripping. I mean, usually my face hurt from smiling and laughing for three days in a <laughs> row. But other than that, you know, you you, you almost have this um, renewed sense of, of everything around you. You know, you kind of feel like, wow, everything feels new again. So I, I would say that I'd much rather um, in a clinical setting be given a you know a therapeutic dose of a hallucinogen and and have fun uh then then be wired up with a you know gag in my mouth to keep me from biting my tongue off and have somebody zap my brain uh that yeah that, you know seems barbaric yeah to me, I think. Uh, you know e ect has been successful in, in helping and helping people for which you know no other treatments can help it can be effective it just does come with these clear side effects and and it has to be repeated over time and you know, maybe the case with psychedelics. So we may we may find out that psychedelics need to be re-administered every three months or six months or one year. But 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 the the the, uh, the aftermath of that does seem to vary quite a, a lot from from the aftermath of ECT. So explain functional MRI. How is it different than just regular MRI? Is regular MRI just static, and functional means we're watching things in real time light up? Yeah. So so I'll try my best here. I'm not a physicist, and I think. To get the precise answer, you need a physicist. But basically, you know, MRI and functional MRI use the same device to do different things. Uh, the MR and, and, and MRI can 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 come in many forms. There's you know the, a static kind of uh, anatomical MRI that gets a real. It's almost like a 3D X-ray of your brain, but it doesn't use mm -hmm. any radiation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are other techniques with MRI that that can look at. Uh, the orientation and density of white matter tracts in your brain, like almost like long range network connections in your brain, structural mm -hmm. connections. Mm -hmm. Other forms of MRI can look at the concentration of different metabolites in different areas of your brain, like magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Functional MRI 
uses properties of the magnetic signal in your brain to try to track changes that are related to blood flow and blood oxygenation. So, so what happens during a functional MRI is that, uh, like a, 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 think of it like a slice of your brain will mm -hmm. be will be uh, magnetized, right? Very strongly. And then a little bit of radio frequency energy will be projected into that slice. Mm -hmm. and, and a small number of water molecules and, and a small number of, 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 blood, uh, of blood cells will orient to whatever that, that field is, that, mm -hmm. that magnetization, mm -hmm. they'll orient yeah. with it. And right. when, you, when you shoot in the radio frequency energy, what it does is it knocks those, knocks those ions off off of off of that orientation as they absorb that radio frequency energy they get knocked off of orientation but as soon as you stop putting the radio frequency energy back they slowly return to that orientation and they reflect back out the energy that they absorb so so uh, functional mri includes magnetization shooting in the rf energy and then listening to see where it's read back out and and, and and areas of that areas of that space that have higher concentrations of Deoxyhemoglobin Austria. versus oxyhemoglobin. Thank you. We we we, so, we lost you, and when you said areas of of those, oh, so I lost you too. I hope. Sorry, I hope this isn't breaking down now. Um, can you hear me now? Uh, oh, we you're in and out right now. I guess we're on wireless. Is that what it is? Uh, yeah, it's honestly better than the wired connection right right where I am. But okay, so am I back online now? Yeah, you are. Okay. Okay. Great. So, so, so you have you have a, a an area brain that's been magnetized, and then you shoot radio frequency energy out into it, and then you listen to see where that radio frequency energy is being reflected back out, right. and and areas that have higher or lower levels of oxygenated blood will differ in the way that they reflect out the the radio frequency energy. And so, right. when a brain region when a brain region does something, it essentially consumes oxygen and glucose and a couple of other things, but, but, but then the brain will flood that region with fresh blood. Right. And, and this, uh, this functional MRI technique can, can, can differentiate between regions that have oxygenated or a low, you know, high concentration of oxygenated blood and a low concentration of oxygenated blood. Which indicates so activity, we, which would yes, indicate activity. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Okay. So, okay. so we do this like one slice here, one slice here, one slice here, one slice here, once to start over, one, 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 one. And you can get a whole brain image in two seconds. And then we just keep getting whole brain images every two seconds for as long as it takes us to answer the question. That we and, and you can determine what areas of the brain are being stimulated because they're consuming more oxygen and you can tell what activity is. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Very, yeah, very yeah. interesting. So yeah. um, what, so, so what, what are the next steps for your group right now? Right. So, so, you know, this colostrum paper was conducted in a small sample of, of, of otherwise healthy individuals and, um, we try. This is really just the first step. Uh, the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research at Hopkins was recently uh, established in September of 2019 uh, to really expand our footprint and to begin to ask uh, quite a few more questions. And and we're we're launching into studies with major depressive disorder uh, and and also substance use disorders. But we're also branching out to see if there's a signal in new indications like anorexia or opioid use disorder. And OCD. I, I got to think OCD would be a good target for you guys. And we're starting a study. We're, we're getting a study up and running with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and, and so the, the, we have lots of lots of irons in the fire, both getting more data and more precise data on, on conditions that we're familiar with and then new data on new conditions to see how far the the uh, therapeutic effects can stretch, but we're also wrapping around these uh, these studies, these clinical trials, um, a number of efforts to try to really document and better understand how brain function changes over time. So the colostrum uh, study was conducted during the acute effect of psilocybin, um, but but we want to look now a week, a month, and three months out to see well what's changing over time. Right. And ultimately, right. all right. of this information will hopefully come together so that we can optimize treatment and therapy for people if this does ever get approved for a medication. Yeah. And it's got to it, it's got to get approved eventually. I mean, it, it, I can't imagine there's so much great information and great work being done in this area that it's hard for me to believe that it won't get uh, the green light at some point in time in the future. Um, well, I want to take our last commercial break. I have a couple more questions for you. We're talking right now with Dr. Frederick Barrett. Uh, and he's with John Hopkins Medicine. We've been talking about how uh, psychedelic drugs affect a specific area of the brain 
a newly discovered area of the brain called the claustrum. It's very, very fascinating. Uh, just another piece in the puzzle. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. <clears throat> Planet Earth CBD offers a fast-acting transdermal patch that targets your aches and pains for the relief you need. Not only is the patch uniquely packed, but it is widely believed to provide larger quantities of available cannabinoids to the source of pain than other brands' subpar products. Effective for 24 to 48 hours, experience the benefits of Planet Earth's high-quality transdermal patch. Manufactured by Next Generation Technology in an FDA-registered facility, this pressure-sensitive adhesive delivers rich hemp extract directly through the skin. Be it a neck ache or a headache, you can count on CBD to take off the edge. Go to planetearthcbd.com today to learn more. I love beef. And if you love beef, listen up. I've discovered the best tasting beef in the world, and that's not an exaggeration, at Piedmontese.com. The Piedmontese breed is famous from Italy for being lean and unbelievably tender with half the fat and calories of traditional beef. Even typically tough cuts are tender when it comes from the Piedmontese cows. And for the first time ever, Piedmontese cows are being raised here in the USA. Get two free 10-ounce New York strips when you purchase $50 or more at Piedmontese.com with code SHR. Go to P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E dot com and use code SHR today. You will never eat any other type of beef ever again. You've heard me talk about the chill pill on the show and how effective it is at helping people who suffer from social anxiety or sometimes when you just want to take the edge off uh, to a long, stressful day. Well, listen to this story from Dylan Goutreau. Definitely takes anxiety away, which I have a long history of. Having started out at two milligrams a day of Xanax, that was at eight years old, and so I stopped using benzos three years ago. Extremely difficult. Yeah, so I spent about three years trying to find anything and everything I could that would be healthy for me um, to help with anxiety. Because I'm talking, you know, full bull out panic attack. The the chill pill was the first thing that I found that actually, in the middle of a panic attack, I can take, and it definitely uh, subsides. Go to drseeds.com. That's D R. R-S-E-E-D-S dot com. Use coupon code SHR and save 20% off your first bottle of the chill pill. Check it out. I promise this is one supplement that delivers. If you suffer from digestive issues like gas, bloating, cramping, even when you're eating healthy, nutritious foods, then you could probably benefit from a high quality enzyme. As you know, I'm a mega fan of Bioptimizers. They're one of the few supplement companies who I use religiously because their products work. I asked them for a great deal for my listeners and they over-delivered. Right now, you can get a bottle of Masszyme for free. All you need to do is pay a small shipping fee and there's no catch, no tricks, no forced continuity, nothing to cancel. They're so confident in their product that they offer a 365-day money-back guarantee. I'm positive you'll love the results. I strongly suggest you head over to their site to grab your free bottle before this offer runs out. Go to masszymes.com slash SHR free. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S dot com slash S-H-R-F-R-E-E, all one word. You will automatically get access to your unique coupon code to claim your free bottle, and there's a limit, one per household. Quest Nutrition makes bars, cookies, chips, and pizzas out of complete dairy-based proteins. Our products minimize net carbs and sugar without sacrificing taste. Each delicious chocolate-flavored chip Cookie Chunk and Crunchy Crumble is custom made to maintain Quest macros. It's time to enjoy foods that work for you, not against you. It's time to enjoy your Quest. Chronic stress leaves us tired, distracted, and physically vulnerable. Apollo Neuro is here to help you take control. Apollo Neuro is a new wearable that trains your nervous system to be more resilient to stress. Apollo's gentle vibrations use your sense of touch to help you recover from stress, going from fight or flight to rest and digest so you can relax, get to sleep, focus, and stay healthy. Developed by physicians and neuroscientists, Apollo Neuro has been tested in multiple clinical trials and is proven to improve heart rate variability, the key biometric of stress. Special offer for friends of Superhuman Radio. Try Apollo Neuro today and get 15% off your purchase at apolloneuro.com slash superhuman. That's A-P-O-L-L-O-N-E-U-R-O dot com slash superhuman. Spit that out right now. This is the Superhuman Channel. Welcome back to Superhuman Radio. We're talking with Dr. Frederick Barrett from John Hopkins Medicine. We've been talking about psychedelics and uh, how they may be the future of uh, treating a, a variety of of different uh, 
uh, disorders like uh, OCD, depression, and so on. So I have to ask you, uh, Dr. Barrett, have you ever used any psychedelics? We, we, we generally don't answer that question for a lot of reasons. I mean, yeah, I get you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so thanks, but I'm going to pass. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Um, so do you, do you feel, are you guys planning on colla corroborating or collaborating with any other uh, universities out there that are doing work in this area? Because it seems like there's lots of different groups that are looking at this stuff right now. There are lots of different groups, and, and we've been involved in assisting other groups in getting up, up and running and getting started. Um, we've, we're, uh, we've also uh, been involved and will continue to be involved in, in multi-site clinical trials. So, so right now there's a multi-site clinical trial being uh, organized by something called the USONA Institute, which is a, is a, is a, a private company out of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. That, that essentially uh, is, is, is just serving this role of being a coordinating center for, for a number of different sites uh, to, to look at the effects of psilocybin in major depressive disorder. Um, and, and they're conducting a phase three clinical trial that has that is, uh, been designed uh, with the input of the FDA. And at the end of this clinical trial, if all of the endpoints are met, that might actually lead to, to approval by the FDA of, of, of psilocybin as medication. Um, there's a lot of value in collaborating with other universities directly, but there's also a lot of value in not doing that because to the extent that you can have independent labs and independent research organizations uh, kind of come up with corroborating evidence, that becomes much more powerful than than a bunch of people who are all in the same room making working the same together. Thing. Yeah. You know, yeah, that makes perfect sense because because the 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 real value in science is the reproducibility by other people that shows that the science is valid. Um, so, right. I mean, that, and, that, and part of the that's, scientific that's method the rigor, is, that's the rigors yeah. of science. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and challenging each other's ideas. Like, you know, we don't, we don't all agree on what the real brain mechanisms are. We don't, we, we don't all agree on, on, on what the exact right approach to administering these, these uh, compounds is. And so uh, that's, that's what makes, that's what makes science challenging each other's ideas and seeing what, seeing what the data say. Yep. If, if the claustrum, uh, is, seems to be the primary, uh, uh, point of activity for psychedelic molecules. Uh, what are some of the other areas of activity that you see uh, psychedelics like psilocybin uh, activating and affecting in the brain? Well, it's it's uh, it's it's an interesting question. So so there are these serotonin these serotonin two A receptors are distributed throughout many different parts of the brain. We see high concentrations of the 2A receptor in a brain region called the posterior cingulate, which is kind of back here and in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, the posterior cingulate is involved in, in, in supporting uh, self-referential processing. When you're asking questions like, does that adjective describe me? Is that a behavior that I would exhibit? It, it, does that face look like mine or like somebody else's? Those, these are all somewhat mediated by the posterior cingulate. It's also involved in autobiographical memory to some extent. Um, so, uh, but the, the visual system, maybe not surprisingly, also has a high high concentration of serotonin two A receptors. There are nuclei within the thalamus. Uh, the thalamus is like a sensory relay station, um, and there are uh, nuclei within the thalamus that have expression of two A receptors. And and, uh, and 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 all of these brain regions are are, are brain regions that show differences with uh, functional MRI uh, when you're comparing on or off. Uh, drug with with a variety of psychedelics, and so and so the claustrum the claustrum finding is really adding to this already developing literature showing all these other changes, suggesting what the claustrum might be the initiator, possibly maybe not, but mm -hmm. but um yeah yeah, and and, and there th these serotonin receptors are in other tissue too, right? They're in the gut, they're in the heart. Oh yeah, so oh, yeah, they're uh, all over. I would imagine that these uh, these drugs have to be having some sort of effect on other parts of the body. It'd be interesting that now that science is involved and not just a bunch of kids sitting around their basement, listening to Pink Floyd, uh, you know, the, 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 I'm sure we're going to discover other, other attributes of these molecules, right? Yeah. One of the questions that really should be asked that, that, that we're gearing up to try to try to address is, is the relationship of, of uh, the gut microbiome and, and psychedelic drug effects, uh, especially with the, the, the expression of 2A receptors in the gut, all over the gut. Um, and, uh, you know, some of these things may just be kind of secondary, like, yeah, there are two A receptors in the heart, in heart muscle and heart tissue. Um, and, and you see an increase in blood pressure and heart rate during psychedelics. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe that's, maybe that's the right. effect. We know all right. about that effect. Right. Um, but 
But yeah, really, uh, I'll, I'll keep saying, you know, we're at the tip of the iceberg in understanding the effects of these drugs on the mind and the body. And, and uh, I, 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 I'm humbled and, and kind of uh, uh, elated that, that, that I get to be in the driver's seat of some of this research. So it's, it's a really what, what other, So it looks like you're <laughs> looking at some other molecules that have a psychedelic aspect. What is salvinorin A? Yeah, uh, salvinorin A is is uh, is is a, is a is a compound within within uh, a plant uh, that has been used by I believe the Mazatec Indians uh, for for at least some uh, some time uh, for 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 ritual and, and, and kind of spiritual purposes. Um, it's it's a it's a compound. Is that, is that, that ayahuasca? Is that what is that no, what they use no, in it's, ayahuasca? It's, Completely different, yeah. Completely different plant. Completely different compound. Uh, this compound is not a serotonin two A receptor agonist. It is a kappa opioid receptor agonist, and that doesn't that doesn't lend it to any of the abuse liability of what we think of traditional abused opioids, which are all mu opioid receptor agonists. This is a kappa opioid receptor agonist, and the kappa opioid receptor itself is also very kind of um, uh, elusive and, and and not nearly as much as known about it. Um, there are individuals right now and, and for some time now doing studies on the kappa opioid receptor to see if it has anti so like pain, some kind of pain relief uh, uh, qualities with, and how it interacts with mu opioid receptors. Can it be used in the treatment of opioid use disorder? Um, and, and, but salvinorin A is unique in, in so far as when you chew it or vaporize and inhale it, it gives you a pretty stark change in consciousness that many people have said is is in many ways similar to psychedelic effects, especially with inhaled hallucinogens. So, so uh, the, the, the strongest comparison has been made between inhaled vaporized DMT and inhaled salvinorin A, except people always uh, make it clear that salvinorin A is a lot less fun. Uh, there, there's, there's very dysphoric. Um, but but the, the, the question is then, well, if, if there are any similarities between salvinorin A effects and classic psychedelic effects, why and how and, and and what's going on there because uh, because they have completely different pharmacological action so salvinorin a doesn't bind at all to the serotonin 2 a receptor and 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 none of the classic psychedelics are known to bind to the kappa opioid receptor so we actually just finished um writing up and we have under review now for publication a, a, a manuscript demonstrating that salvinorin a uh changes default mode network uh activity and connectivity in ways that are similar to that which is observed with classic psychedelics. It also changes the, the function of uh, other task positive or executive networks in similar ways. Um, and after that, we're going to go after the claustrum question as well. We're going we're to follow up with another paper to really look into the effects of salvinorin A on the claustrum. And, and, and I guess the punchline here is that aside, it, the, the claustrum expresses lots of different receptors, not just serotonin 2A, right. but it expresses serotonin 2A very densely. And it also expresses the kappa opioid receptor very densely. So uh, it's it's one of it's one of the it's one of the densest expressions in the brain of the kappa opioid receptor. So if we can demonstrate similar effects in psilocybin and salvinorin A on claustral function, then we may really uh, go some way towards arguing for a kind of a a, a a a a mechanism underlying psychedelic drug effects that cuts across different drug classes that are all mm. considered psychedelics or hallucinogens. Very interesting. Well, I hope that you'll come back on the show as more research. Uh, comes forth. So, Be happy to do so. Uh, I'll make sure that Elisa stays uh, on your radar, and uh, we'll okay. get you back on. I, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show today. This is fascinating stuff, and it's it really is another piece of the puzzle. And I can't wait to see ten, fifteen years from now uh, where this all ends up because um, I've been such a fan of hallucinogenic since I was a very young man, <laughs> and all of a sudden it's become in vogue again. And I'm and I'm I'll I'll say it. I you know I I. I tripped more than uh, uh, than a lot of other things that I've done in my life when I was a young man. And so there you go. Listen, thanks so much for being uh, on the air with me today. Take care. Well, thanks. Thanks for your interest. All right. All right. We're going to take one quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about foraging. That's right. And it's becoming more popular now that people are shut down. You can't get toilet paper. If you could find that in the forest, you'd go get it. But you could clearly find food if you know what to look for. And uh, we're going to talk to my two guests in a moment, Vi Violet Brill and uh, her dad, Steve Brill, uh, who are experts in foraging to teach you uh, how to forage and uh, not run into something that 
that kills you. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Superhuman Radio. Everybody wants to feel better, be healthier and happier. If you don't sweat profusely on a regular basis, you won't feel as good as you could. Studies have shown the power of infrared sauna. Infrared penetrates one to two inches into the body. It helps those with back pain, fibromyalgia, arthritis, depression, and anxiety. Patients get relief from infrared sauna. The Good Health Sauna has been shown to be an exercise mimetic, conveying many of the same benefits as cardio. There are a lot of reasons people buy a Good Health Sauna, but the bottom line is you will be a much happier, healthier person by using the Good Health Sauna every day. You'll crave it. You'll love it. And it will be the best purchase you have ever made. Good Health Saunas provide commercial grade saunas for in-home and commercial use, backed by the best lifetime warranty in the industry. Unmatched customer service and the best financing makes owning one easy and will fit any budget. Go to goodhealthsauna.com slash superhuman radio to learn more and save 25% off. New Mass Pro Synthogen X2 just upped its own legendary game. To distance itself even further from the rest of the pack, Synthogen X2 now has double the key active ingredients. If you've ever wondered what steroid like recovery feels like, Synthogen X2 delivers. See why others compare it favorably to powerful bodybuilding drugs at Synthogen.com. Mass Pro Synthogen. When you train with it, you'll gain with it. Select Savory Snacks Original Biltong is the healthier alternative to sugar-laden beef jerky. Their sugar-free biltong is seasoned and then air-dried for up to two weeks, providing you with one of the most tender and flavorful meat snacks that you've ever had. They also use a fattier cut of beef, which adds to the tenderness and gives their biltong even better flavor. Select Savory Snacks Original Biltong is the perfect snack or travel companion for your busy life. Get a free meat snack sample pack with every order of $75 or more. Get yours today at selectsavorysnacks.com slash shr use code shr free unlock your potential with the best cognitive enhancement and anti-aging supplements on the market pure nootropics.net goes the extra mile for the highest quality ingredients third party tested to make sure you only receive the best your money can buy there's no better choice with a money back guarantee and free shipping try their best selling dhm dihydromyricetin prevents hangovers and helps deliver detox after a night of drinking get your dhm and other nootropics and longevity supplements from pure nootropics.net Net, the purest supplements around. Do you remember those delicious toaster pastries you had when you were a kid? You know, the rectangular sugar-filled snacks? Well, guess what? Legendary Foods has just made low-carb toaster pastry. This is the first of its kind, and honestly, these things are amazing. They have three to four net carb, less than one gram of sugar, and nine grams of protein. You can eat them right out of the wrapper or lightly toast them. The only question is, which flavor, strawberry or brown sugar cinnamon? They're available at eatlegendary.com and Amazon. I love beef. And if you love beef, listen up. I've discovered the best tasting beef in the world, and that's not an exaggeration, at piedmontese.com. The Piedmontese breed is famous from Italy for being lean and unbelievably tender with half the fat and calories of traditional beef. Even typically tough cuts are tender when it comes from the Piedmontese cows. And for the first time ever, Piedmontese cows are being raised here in the USA. Get two free 10 ounce New York strips when you purchase $50 or more at Piedmontese.com with code SHR. Go to P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E dot com and use code shr today you will never eat any other type of beef ever again this is the superhuman channel doing reps with the weight of the world i'm laughing because uh, we've been having a little chat conversation in the background this is violet brill and her dad wild man steve brill and so the images that i've had up for the uh Magic mushrooms, which came from a uh, from a, a, a royalty free image library that I subscribe to, said that they were psilocybin mushrooms, but uh, Steve said they're not. They're actually honey mushrooms, and uh, they're very delicious, and they won't make you hallucinate. And he and I, when I told him off the air, I said, "Oh, I got them from a library." He said, "Don't ever go on a mushroom tour with them." Yeah, you're right because they'll poison me, right? <laughs> uh, no, they will. Yeah, they will. They will. The, the only hallucination you'll get from honey mushrooms is that you're in heaven because they taste so good. Interesting. Interesting. And they are they are deadly though. If you're a tree, <laughs> if you're stay away from tree. them. Yeah, an oak forest. Oh. They'll kill an entire forest of trees. 
no kidding. So they're poisonous. They're parasites only, only to the trees, not to people. Oh, okay. Yeah, for okay. people there, for people they're delicious. But if you happen to be a tree, stay away from them. So we have to start at the beginning. So uh, I'm going to affectionately call you Wild Man, Steve Brill, because that's what you're known as. So tell tell your story. It's a fascinating story. You actually got arrested once in New York for foraging in Central Park, right? Uh, yes, I was leading a tour uh, looking for plants, but there were already plants on the tour, undercover agents, a man and a woman. This was March 29th, 1986. They said they were married. They never held hands or kissed, so I figured they'd been married a long time. Uh, the man <laughs> kept taking pictures. I'd hold up the specimen. Only he was Only the I specimen. Was, I was the specimen. He was taking the pictures of me. At the end of the tour, I showed people you could eat the leaf of a dandelion. The male ranger ducked behind a bush. There he is on 81st Street. Go get him. Every park people like ranger. Eat? Yes. Really? Every park ranger in New York City popped up from behind the bushes. They surrounded this is fascinating. me. In case now, now, I was keep going mind, to climb keep up a mind. tree. My grandmother, who was from Italy, used to go out and pick dandelion uh, on the on the sidewalks in in Brooklyn, this you know wherever she could find them, and they would put it in in salads. They would make it in, and I could be wrong about this, but there's a no, song. they're delicious. Yeah, and there, isn't there a song called Poke Salad Annie? Yeah, isn't so Poke Salad Dan? Oh, it's different. No, okay, I thought it was dandelion. We'll, we'll get into okay. that one. We'll get into that one next. Okay, so, uh, so, so, they, 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 so what, were you, what were you doing wrong? What did they say you were doing wrong? Well, the rest of the story, so they tell, they um, hauled him off him to the police station and they handcuffed. Searched my, they searched my backpack. I don't know, didn't if, know if he was looking for weeds or weed. Or weed. Um, but, uh, okay, uh, so they thought maybe they, you, had, you had marijuana on you, you think? Is that what they thought you had? No, no, they knew I was teaching people to eat the dandelions. Uh, I was uh, handcuffed, uh, they searched me, and I was in the police station for three hours. I was charged with criminal mischief for removing vegetation from the park. There's Which would include like a kindergarten kid, like taking out a colored leaf from the park in the fall. Yeah, the regulation is obviously meant that people are cutting down the trees or something, but not eating dandelions. They had an ulterior motive, which I'll get into later. But um, uh, since I had eaten all the evidence, they had to let me go with a desk appearance <laughs> summons that said I could uh, go to jail for up to a year. I was charged with criminal mischief, uh, but it was a big mistake. Uh, I went home and uh, called every every TV station, every wire service, every newspaper. The next day on the way to the newsstand, five cops stopped me. What do you want? I said, I haven't eaten a single dandelion today. I haven't even had breakfast yet. They said, we don't care. We want your autograph. Oh, it, was on front pages. Autograph. it was on front pages of the Chicago Sun-Times, on the NBC, on everything. Yeah, it so was Violet, on, I, Violet, got on, I got on Letterman. Um, oh, even really? the BBC, the BBC covered it. The coronavirus strike is in its fifth week. <laughs> And in New York City, they arrested the one in the middle of Central Park for eating a dead lion. So, That's hilarious. Um, yeah, they still took me to court. So I went to the uh, uh, Manhattan Criminal Courthouse on Center Street and served Wild Man's Five Borough Salad on the steps of the Manhattan Criminal Courthouse to report the press and pass it by. And the yeah, press, press ate it, it up. So, Violet, tell me about you. How, how old are you, Violet? I'm 16, and I started coming on the tours when I was two months old. And I knew all the plans by the time I was six, and I was helping people to like come out to get. I was out going out of the stroller and helping people find the plans on the sidewalks. And and then um, by the time I was nine, I was co-leading the tours. And since I just grew up with everything, it all just like comes to me when I look at the forest. Instead of seeing just a forest of green and brown, I see actually like all the plants and know how to use them. And then last year, I started leading my own tours and I work with kids and at camps and day camps and with school classes. Yeah, but let okay. me finish the story of, of yeah. getting arrested. Go uh, ahead, they go got ahead. so much bad publicity, they dropped the charges and hired me to lead the same tours I was leading when I was arrested. This went viral in 1986 when there wasn't such a thing yet. And I worked for the Parks Department for four years and it turned out to answer your question, the real reason 
they arrested me is because the administrators were terrified of frivolous lawsuits, imagining that if they allowed me to do foraging mm. tours, someone would pretend to have been foraging, poison themselves, and sue the city. It's called false arrest, and I wish they'd do it again. That's something. So they would, and it's true, there are nothing but frivolous lawsuits out there. I could see them worrying about that, but arresting you, that's not the answer. I mean, that, that was silly. Who was the mayor at that time? That was Koch, and the parks commissioner was Henry uh, Stern. I like Koch. I actually liked him. I thought he was a good mayor. I thought he was a good mayor. Well, that, 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 uh, Koch got so many angry letters that he told Stern, what's this wild thing all about? Settle it. And then Stern uh, reversed and hired me. That's funny. That is funny. So foraging is becoming even more popular today in the wake of COVID-19 and people having to be shut down and going to the grocery stores and not finding uh, the foods that they want. Uh, the, the people are, are kind of uh, reawakening to this idea that, hey, I could probably find what I want right here in my backyard or in, in the wooded area behind my home, right? Yeah, people have been doing this for thousands of years. Before this time, people, the Native Americans used plants like black birch, which has um, low-dose aspirin in it, and you could use it as a painkiller. All the native plants, before it was turned into farmland and then settlements, it was all, north, the northeast was all forests. So people have already been using it for thousands of years. And now that COVID is happening, they're definitely, we've definitely been seeing more people being interested in foraging and turning to foraging now that um, the grocery stores aren't all open and people can't exactly get what they want. And everything outside has the same nutrition and health benefits that a lot of the stuff in the stores do, if not more. And it's definitely a great alternate resource for people besides the so groceries. We, we, we talk about evolution on this show a lot. And we always talk about hunter-gatherers. We were hunter-gatherers. For, for the majority of evolution, we were hunter-gatherers. For this small sliver of time, we go to grocery stores, we go to the refrigerator. So it's, it's very, very different. But what you're doing is nothing more than our ancestors did every single day, right? They, they walked, they found food, they chewed food, they walked some more, they found some more food, they chewed some more food, right? This is, this is natural. Yeah, well, they didn't actually have to spend that much time finding their food for the day. It's uh, less time than going to the store and waiting online at the checkout counter. The stuff is just out there, and it's pretty easy to recognize. If we have people who come on about 10 tours in different parks at different times of the year, uh, they know uh, well over 90% of the common edible plants, and they see them over and over again in different seasons. It's actually a very easy subject uh, to learn if someone teaches it to you. With me, I had to learn it on my own with uh, with books. This is before the internet. But, and it, it took a while and we're still learning things. And mm -hmm. we just found a new wild mustard we'd never seen a few days ago. Uh, we were in uh, um, German Pennsylvania for a family mm -hmm. tour. We live in uh, Westchester, New York. So uh, new habitat, we only been there once. and immediately a new plant. Yeah, so everything, once people on the tour see it once, then they go outside and they see it over and over again. And I grew up with it. So like, to me, it's like recognizing like what lamb's quarters or common plantain is outside in our backyard. It's like recognizing what a tomato or a carrot is in the grocery store. It's just all different right. plants from different um, air, from like our area instead of fruits imported from like the tropics. So yeah, what, we so have invasive. Ahead, we have invasive things also from other countries that the native people did not have. Uh, so we actually have more wild foods than the Native Americans did, uh, right. uh, which right. can be dangerous. I mean, I have so many recipes now. Uh, I open my freezer. One of them can fall out on my foot. <laughs> really? So uh, the question I have right off the bat is it's one thing to go out into pristine uh, forest areas and find these plants but doing it in central park aren't you worried about or, or as an example or a local park aren't you worried about things that could have gotten on the plants chemicals or dog urine or anything like that 
Well, in the first, so first, so in the country, when there's in like the forest, there's also a deer. The deer eat a lot of the plants that we're searching for. And when we go into um, the city parks, you don't pick anything near traffic. Um, if there are dogs, we say to wash everything off when you get home, but we don't pick or like right near the fences or anything away from traffic. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and so we'll clean everything off. And um, there's different habitats in the city. So instead of walking just through the forest in the country, you may not find what you find in disturbed habitats and open fields, like the little invasive plants, like a plant called wood sorrel. Sorrel means sour, it tastes like lemonade. Um, burdock, which is the root you can use and tastes like potatoes. And mm -hmm. it's different habitats. You can literally go from a field to a wetland to into the woods, just like that. And you can find majorities, like a majority of all the um, stuff that we harvest is from these disturbed areas that aren't just all shaded out by the trees. If you're going right. for mushrooms, then again, then late summer and fall, you go into the oak forests and under pines and then you get all of those. Is yeah, it, is except it, when you is were when you were ten, when you were Good. ten, we were driving along a suburban street on the way to uh, Inwood Hill Park, and uh, what did you spot? I found a thirty-pound right. chicken mushroom, oh. just on a tree on yeah. someone's someone's driveway. And those are and delicious did, mushrooms. Did you go remove it? Yeah, we took on the some. Way back. Yeah, on the way when we came back <laughs> home, back. we took half of it. We cooked it, and every recipe fried chicken mushroom. I made one the other day that I found in my grandma's yard. I coated it with like breadcrumbs, and I fried it so it was like fried chicken tenders, um, mm. fried fried chicken mushroom and soups, anything like that. And it was delicious. And the next day, my dad had another tour with chefs that he came back with, and they took the rest of it back home. Yeah, so I'm is sure it, the homeowner it, didn't care that we removed a fungus, uh, an awful fungus. Yeah, from his tree. and it, it would probably dry out and be gone in a, in, a, in a week anyway. They wouldn't even know it was gone. Uh, is it safe to assume that if the deer are eating a plant, that it's safe for humans to eat it as well? No. No, not at all. Um, no, you have to be a hundred percent sure with everything that you're picking. Um, there are poisonous plants, deer, there are different animals. They have like just di um, different digestive systems. Like birds have different digestive system than us, so they actually eat the berries of poison ivy, which obviously we can't eat. And mm -hmm. they'll just they'll eat everything. They actually brought goats into Prospect Park in Brooklyn and to eat out all the weeds that's in there. And some of them include poisonous plants like white snake root. Yeah, because, white snake because root we killed, have, we have Lincoln's, a killed Lincoln's mother. Oh, um, really? Sure. Yeah, her cow went into the woods. This was before they were required to have pastures for the cows. They browsed in the woods. Yeah, it's in Europe, there's no harm. This is a native plant that stops your brain from telling your heart to beat. Very deadly. They've only found one person who can eat that plant without being harmed. And that, of course, is Donald Trump. He has no brain and he has no heart. Oh, uh, <laughs> we're not uh, gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna yeah. get political now. We're not gonna get political. So oh, I was gonna tell you what happens if you burn poison ivy oh and breathe in the smoke; it'll kill you. But there's one person who's immune to that, and that's Ooh. Bill Clinton. He doesn't inhale. <laughs> that's a good one. So, um, I found an interesting uh, a bit of information. So we we've been feeding deer for some time. We feed them corn which probably isn't the best thing for them, but that's what everybody feeds them. And so we stopped feeding them one week because we went out of town. And when we came home, they had eaten all the plants that Elisa had worked so hard to cultivate this year. And they especially liked the succulents, which they probably wouldn't find very easily. But one of the only plants they never eat year after year, we had foxglove growing in some parts of the yard. And I, I learned that foxglove is deadly. In fact, the molecule in foxglove became a uh, an arrhythmia Digitalis. drug. D digitalis. And that even small amounts will stop your heart. And I always found it interesting that the, the deer ate everything, but they never ate the foxglove. They would even eat the flowers off of the hostess. They'd eat the leaves of the hostess. They ate everything, but oh, they those never are, Those are edible them. for people too. Are they really? They look like salad. That's good. But they yeah. eat them in Japan. That's I'm, I've only been doing this 38 years, and this is the first year I learned that hosta is uh, is edible. It's not in any of the books, certainly not in mine, but it will be in an update of my app. Um, 
just took me uh, 38 years to discover that those are uh, traditionally eaten in Japan. And you so, get the so shoots when they're young. So I found this out right after the shoots were too big. I have to wait like 11 months to actually try it. Oh, wow. And that's interesting. So, so now, Violet, you're actually helping people who are homeschooling to try to add something new to the curriculum for their children where they're actually taking them out and teaching them to forage. Is that correct? How's that going? Yeah. So we're like, we definitely, we work with a bunch of kids. I work with Girl Scout groups. I have been a counselor at the Audubon, um, Greenwich Audubon Society at their nature day camp. We work at schools and camps in the summer, except for this summer, um, Boy Scout troops. And we definitely try to educate the kids because it's definitely, it's the youth generation that's learned that needs to learn how to take care of their environment now before um, everything that we're doing to harm the climate and harm our earth is will progress into the future because they're the future generation. They're the key if they, if they're not, they, we don't think that they should just sit in the classroom every day, kept inside, not exposed, no, expo um, no exposure to the outside environment and the environment around them and just um, taught everything, taking tests. Like I know, I don't know everything about all the plants outside, the edible medicinal properties of them. I've never taken a test of this in my life. And you really have to connect them to the outside world because that's, if they have fun doing something outside, they're not being forced to learn something or forced to memorize something, then they're gonna wanna take care of it in the future. So we still have our earth and they're really the key to doing that. And we'd have kids come on the tours. We have them come on the tours. They have their family and they have fun and we're playing games with the plants. We have a book foraging with kids and it has stories about the plants, from folklore and mythology. And we really try to get the kids engaged in what they're doing, what they're learning. So they're going to have fun doing it and continue to take care of the environment when they grow up. Yeah, what about we have generation sticks? Yeah, and we've had generations yeah. come on our tours. We had a homeschooling group that we always took to Bear Mountain and um and we've had the mom who came on the tours when or the dad when he was a kid and then the mom and now there's a little girl and she came on the tours. There was um this man Ruben who came on tours and my dad when he was a kid with my dad and now he is um in Forest Park he's making the abandoned railroad tracks um underneath the park into the Queen's um greenway. So it's going to be a walkway with a bunch and it's inspired from when my dad led the tours with him. I used yeah, to spend a lot of time in Forest Park when I was a kid. <laughs> that was my, I, I, I originally grew up in Bed, Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, but then we moved to Richmond Hill, uh, South. Oh, Coast and I grew up in, I there. grew up in Kew Gardens. Oh, sure. So I had, a, I had an uncle that, uh, that had a, uh, uh, clothing store in Kew Gardens. I used to love what Kew was Gardens. It called? You know, I was just going to say it and I can't think of it now. As soon as so we get off the air, you'll remember it. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly That's what I how remember. it works with me. So, so um, do you think people are interested in this more for the novelty, or do you find that people that you train actually use foraging on a regular basis to put stuff on their table? A lot of them do. We've had, we have people who we, we became friends with, um, and like they've connected to the environment. They've definitely like, gone further they're always telling they bring us mushrooms they come on tours we have friends who've started coming on tours who've been coming on tours for years with us and it's definitely we make our diet maybe like 10 or 15 percent of foraged foods we mm. have like the wild nuts like black walnuts hickory nuts a lot of the mm. berries during the season um purple flowering raspberry the blackberries are in season now and they are delicious and then all really? the really i thought outside. blackberries i thought oh, blackberries, blackberries have goodbye. actually become blackberries have actually become very rare in the past few years and it's kind of no. sad because really? there's Why? too much competition with the iphone what Blackberries. Oh, you stinker, you blackberries. I remember now the blackberry, yeah. the blueberry. You're funny. You're funny. Yeah, so I, I, it took me a second to catch that. Yeah. I forgot all about blackberries. They're so I haven't seen one in so long. Exactly. That's funny. Well, just what we said. 
So we definitely make our diet out of a lot of the foods that we find outside. I'm walking down the path outside. I won't hesitate to like pick, I won't, I'll chew on the black birch twigs or pick like the flower head off of a plant called garlic mustard, which has a delicious Mm. um, garlicky flavor that we make pesto out of the leaves and the root tastes like horseradish. And Mm. um, it's a type of mustard. So it's related to broccoli. And um, we definitely have people that go, we, they go outside and they collect um, herbs and plants and they bring them home and people who come on our tours collect um collect all the bags of what of herbs and greens that we're finding and then i see on instagram they're posting oh i just made a whole like salad and a whole meal out of it and they're going to continue wow. to do this yeah and do it's you eat, do you eat? It's really really tasty and Steve, i'm, I'm you... 71 and i'm in in perfect uh, perfect health before they closed all the health clubs i was swimming a mile in 42 minutes Nice. And uh, do, I do rapid walking and biking and yoga, light weights, calisthenics, and I'm a whole foods vegan. And my only health problem, and this can't be cured, is uh, a case of CCD. Yeah, compulsive cooking disorder. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. And you answered my other question. I was asking if animal protein plays a role in the, uh, in the diet at all. So you're, you're well, sometimes, vegan. I mean, if no one's looking, I won't hesitate to pull out and devour a cattail. And <laughs> eat lamb's quarters, sheep sorrel, pig weed. Yeah, yeah my dad's a vegan. I eat, I eat how I eat very healthy. I'm not also a vegan, but um, definitely we find my dad takes like supplements and he finds all the protein and everything and like other um, vegetables and like beans and the nuts. So, so we you're, definitely you're, get you're, 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 Violet, you're not a vegan or, or you are a vegan? I'm not a vegan. I are you don't like eat... a lot la- you eat eggs or fish? I eat eggs and fish. I eat eggs and fish so, and cheese. So the, the healthiest diet on the planet, the longest lived people on the planet are lacto ovo vegetarians. They they eat uh, kefir and 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 uh, yogurt, they eat eggs and they eat vegetables, they don't eat meat. And those mm-hmm. are, uh, I'm trying to think, I did a show about them, the Hunza, the Hunza. The Hunza, yeah. yeah they, I, think it depends on, vegetarians. I think it depends on your metabolism too. So uh, I've had lots of heart disease in my, in my family. So mm-hmm. I definitely don't want to mess around with, no. uh, with animal fats. Absolutely. And, uh, again, yeah. it, it depends. Uh, you have to, you have to see what really is working Works for, for you. Yeah. That's Your genes and metabolism true. play like a big role in it, but like definitely the diet is a huge part. Absolutely. We're learning so much about epigenetic effects now that uh, we're starting to understand that our genetics are not uh, a death sentence. Let's just say it that way. Exactly. So uh, I want to give your website. So the website is Wildman Steve, Steve Brill. Steve Brill. Brill. I, I'm trying to get it to come up here. Here it is. Here it is. Okay, WildmanStevebrill.com. People can go there. They now you have an app. You said. Yeah, it's just being updated. There are some bugs. Uh, sadly, my, my earlier right developer injured his legs. Yeah, then he dragged his feet for the next two years. Sorry <laughs> for the lame joke. Uh, and plus, so and plus, there's some in, bugs in it. We, you said there's bugs in it. I was gonna say, of course, yeah, we bugs can't have bugs because he's a vegan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. you can't. So eat. that's that should be that should be fixed within a, a week or two, and um, then every then then we're gonna keep uh, adding more features to it. So I have a lot of fun with that, and I'm currently working on an online forging course. Violet and I are doing. Uh, videos with our stories and all the different parts of the plants, uh, videos of recipes as I make them in the in the kitchen, and all our worst jokes. Yeah. And you have a book, too. Don't you have a book? Yes, five, five books. I have five books. Five books, okay. And they're all about foraging. So people can get those books where? At your website? From my website, yeah. If you get them from Amazon, I get like uh, uh, five cents per book. So get them I know. from me. What a bargain. And we will... We will sign. We will sign them. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Wildmanstevebrill.com. And I just thought of something. There was a there was a train station in Kew Gardens that when you went down inside of it, you felt like you went into Europe. It was like a little train station. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Kew Gardens. Yes, the, the Kew train Gardens uh, train station next to the next to what was the Homestead uh, Hotel, which is now a, a, a nursing care facility. 
I used and, to love to ride my bicycle to that train station and go down and sit there. I felt like I was in Europe. I felt like I went back someplace that, that I wasn't. Uh, we probably passed each other on the bicycles. <laughs> I definitely spent a lot of time in Forest Park. In fact, I just did a show before you guys where we talked about psilocybin mushrooms and how psychedelics are actually uh, being used in therapeutic environments to discover if they can help people with major depressive disorder. And one of my favorite things to do was to drop a little acid and go hang out in Forest Park. <laughs> so I was just talking to this uh, this the scientist, and I, I I hope he took everything with a grain of salt. But uh, I have a lot of fond memories of Forest Park. Lots of fond memories. Well, fo Forest Park can be can be dangerous. So when I was sixteen, I lived in Kew Gardens. I bicycled through the park to go to the Woodhaven Boulevard side where they had chess tables. I'm a good chess player, right. and coming back on the railroad trestle for a bunch of teenagers. And since there was just one of me and a bunch of them, they attacked me for no reason. One yeah. of them grabbed my bike. I was scared to death. I pedaled as hard as I could and barely managed to let him, uh, to, to get away from him. But then all the other kids who were considerably older than me and had racing bikes, I had a three speed back then, uh, all got on their bikes to, to chase me down. But you know, the road there is very curvy. And when I yes. went around the curve for a few seconds, they couldn't see me. I uh, ran through the woods with a bike, dropped my bike off the stone wall at Park Lane South and went I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Perpendicular. And they all went right past me as if uh, it was in a movie or something. So if you're ever back in Forest Park and you see these 75 year old men with long gray beards, uh, tattered clothes and rusty bikes saying, where is that guy? We're going to get him. Don't tell them. <laughs> Don't tell them that where you are. Okay. Listen, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. This is fascinating stuff. Yeah. Sure, it's been a pleasure. It's been great. Take okay, care. Happy for it. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, we're going to say goodbye. Uh, tomorrow we have a show with Bioptimizers. We're going to be talking about a new supplement of theirs. And hopefully you can make it for that. Please share today's show. Uh, help people learn the truth about health, fitness, and longevity. We'll see you tomorrow. Don't forget, uh, check us out on Instagram at Superhuman Radio. See you tomorrow.